Section 2.3, Deductive Reasoning. Recall from Chapter 1, we had a section on inductive reasoning. We know that that is making a conjecture or a conclusion based on what has happened in our past experiences. In this section, we're going to work on deductive reasoning or logical reasoning. This uses laws to produce a true conclusion from a true given information. Our first law is called the law of detachment. The law of detachment, in its shortened symbolic term, is if I'm given P then Q, and we know that is a conditional statement, where P is a hypothesis and Q is my conclusion, and we know that this is a true conditional, then if what occurs is P is given back to me, then what I know is the conclusion Q must also be true. And I've given you a procedure to use the law of detachment. The first thing we have is, number one, we're given a true conditional. We need to write that in if-then form, because on step two, we need to identify the hypothesis P and the conclusion Q. Then on step three, if the hypothesis P is restated to you in some form, then I know on step four that I will repeat the conclusion Q because I know that that is a true conclusion or conjecture to the statement. Let's take a look at this example. Use the law of detachment, if possible, to draw a conclusion. If you participated in the 2008 Summer Olympics, then you were in Beijing. So that's step one. I'm given a conditional. Step two is I need to identify the P and Q. If then form, you participated in a 2008 Olympics is our P. That's our hypothesis. Then you were in Beijing, China. That's our Q, our conclusion. Let's read what they gave us on our next step. So here, Michael Phelps was a swimmer in the 2008 Olympics. This is a form of P. So they gave me a fact that a person was a swimmer in the 2008 Olympics. Since that is true, from the law of detachment, I can say if P, then Q is true, and they repeat P to me, which Michael Phelps was a swimmer in 2008 Olympics, then my conclusion is Michael Phelps was in Beijing, China. And this is the law of detachment, a logical reasoning to come to a conclusion. Let's look at another example. Here I'm given a conditional. If two lines are perpendicular, then they form right angles. Step two tells me when I'm using the law of detachment is that I need to identify the P and Q. Here I have two lines are perpendicular. That's my hypothesis, or P. They are right angles. That would be my conclusion, Q. So step one, they have a conditional. Step two, we identify the hypothesis conclusion. Then they were going to give me some sort of information, and we want to relate that back to my original conditional. On my next statement here, I'm given that line AB is perpendicular to line DC. It's not exactly in the form that was originally given to me, but it is in the form of my hypothesis in the original conditional. Therefore, I know that the conditional is true, the second statement is true, and therefore, by the law of detachment, I can conclude that the conclusion is true, which is line A, B, and D, C form right angles. And this conclusion is used and based on the law of detachment. Our next example, we're given a conditional again. If two angles are vertical, then the angles are congruent. Here I have my hypothesis, which is two angles are vertical. That's my P. My conclusion is the angles are congruent. That's a true conditional. Now, on step two, they give me a statement. Angle A is congruent to angle B. That's a fact also. But does this relate back to the hypothesis in my conditional? This relates back to my conclusion. Since it doesn't follow the law of detachment, which is I'm given a true if P then Q, then they must repeat P in some form. 
then I have the law of detachment, which means I can repeat Q. They gave us P, then Q, but didn't give me the hypothesis back to me in some form. Therefore, my conclusion is not possible. All I know is, is that angle A is congruent to angle B. I don't know if they're vertical. And I also know the true statement in the beginning, if two angles are vertical, they are congruent. But I can say nothing about angle A and B being vertical angles. The next law in deductive reasoning is the law of syllogism. And it states, if I'm given a conditional, if P then Q, and I know that's true. And the next conditional they give me is in the form of Q then R. In other words, they repeat the conclusion of the original conditional and then give me some new information. And if those two statements are true, then what I'm allowed to do by the law of syllogism is state if P then R. And that would also be a true statement. The procedure for the law of syllogism is as follows. Number one, we're going to be given a conditional, and we need to identify the hypothesis and conclusion. Then on step two, they're going to give me another conditional. It must be written in a form that the conclusion is related to new information. And it must be in that form, if Q then R. Then what I do for the solution is I write a conditional in the form of if P then R. And if step one, two, and three are followed, this is the law of syllogism. Let's take a look at an example. They want to use the law of syllogism to draw a conclusion. Here, we have a statement, drag racers drive extremely fast. I like to put this in if-then form. That way, we have a better idea of identifying the hypothesis conclusion. We can identify the hypothesis conclusion directly from the statement, but if you need to, put that in if-then form. And if we do, it's going to look like this. If they are drag racers, then they drive extremely fast. Here I have my P, if they are drag racers, and then my Q, drive extremely fast. So I know my hypothesis conclusion. Then on my next step, they give me another conditional. If you drive extremely fast, notice that is my Q repeated. And then it says, if you drive extremely fast, then you love adrenaline. You love adrenaline is a brand new statement to the conditionals. This is R. So notice they give me if P, then Q. They then give me Q, then R. What I can do by the law of syllogism is come to a conclusion that drag racers love adrenaline. Or if in the if then form, if you are a drag racer, then you love adrenaline. And this is by the law of syllogism. In our next example, we're given a conditional, vertical angles are congruent. To help identify the hypothesis conclusion, we write that in if-then form. And here we have, if the angles are vertical, that's our P, then the angles are congruent. That's our Q. And you only need to write that in if-then form if you have trouble identifying that from the original statement. Then they give us another statement that's not in if-then form. Congruent angles have equal measures. We can write that in if-then form, and when we do, it looks like this. If angles are congruent, then they have equal measures. Angles are congruent, and we can see that's from our previous conditional. That's Q. Then they have equal measure. That's brand new information to both conditionals. That's R. Then, from the law of syllogism, we know we have if P, then Q. We have another one that says if Q, then R. That is the form of syllogism. Then, by the law of syllogism, I can make a conclusion that states vertical angles have equal measures. Or, if we put that in if-then form, if angles are vertical, then they have equal measures. And that's by the law of syllogism. Our next example we have a conditional. A midpoint divides a segment into two congruent segments. Again, to help identify the hypothesis conclusion, we can write that in if-then form. If it is a midpoint, that's our P, then it divides a segment into two congruent segments. 
That is our Q. We know that's true. They give us another statement. A midpoint divides a segment into segments that have equal measures. Again, we can write that in if-then form to help us identify parts of the conditional. And here it says, if it is a midpoint, if we go back to our original conditional, if it is a midpoint, is labeled as P. Then it continues. Then it divides the segment into segments of equal measure. Equal measure is different by the congruent segment. So this is new information, which is R. So you can see we're given if P, then Q. And then they have a statement that says P, then R. This does not follow the law of syllogism, which is if P, then Q, then Q, then R. Then I would have a statement if P, then R. This follows if P, then Q, if P, then R. Therefore, my solution or conclusion is this is not possible. This does not follow the law of syllogism. On the next few examples, they want me to use the law of syllogism or detachment to find a conclusion if possible. On our first example, if you want good health, that's P, then you should get eight hours of sleep. That is going to be Q. On our next statement, they tell us Bill gets eight hours of sleep. This is in some form related to our conclusion of our conditional. From the law of detachment, our conditional should be if P then Q, which it is. Then they need to repeat P. Here they repeat Q. And therefore, I cannot use a law of detachment, and my solution is not possible. My next example, it states, if you want to pass the class, that is our hypothesis, P, then you need to do your homework. That is our conclusion. Our next statement is, if you want to pass the class, that is from our original conditional, P being repeated, you need to learn the definitions. That's new information. That's R. So we have if P then Q, if P then R. That does not follow the format of syllogism. Therefore, my conclusion is not possible. My next example, I have if you like math, P, then you will take trigonometry, Q. If you take trigonometry from my original conditional, that repeats Q, then you will take calculus. That is new information. That's R. Now we have if P, then Q. If Q, then R. Therefore, by the law of syllogism, I can state if you like math, then you will take calculus.